as I noted, it's our pleasure to welcome Professor Tobler here today. Professor Tobler is a as a good friend of the Kennedy Center. He has served in a number of capacities over here as the coordinator of European studies, an active member of our research groups, uh, an advisor to our programs here. He received his bachelor's and master's degree from, degrees from BYU and his PhD from the University of Kansas and has been a professor of history at BYU since 1978. He's been very active professionally on a number of, in a number of professional organizations and publishing books and articles co-founded the German Studies Association, and in 1993 was chosen as a delegate for the dedication of the, uh, the United States Memorial Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, recently served as the president of the Poland Warsaw Mission uh, from 1998 to 2001. He tells me a few of his missionaries are in the audience. We welcome you, and welcome all of you to hear Professor Tobler today to lecture on contemporary Poland, an American ally in Central Europe. Please join me in welcoming Professor Doug Tobler. Well, it's very nice to be with you. I've been retired for a few months, and so it's nice to be back on campus for the first time. I'm happy to see all of you who are in the audience today, old friends, older friends, and uh, as mentioned, some of my missionaries, whom I love and treasure, and uh, some former students. I'm happy to see my dear friend Ray Hillam here today. I have known him since I came to campus in 1967. Tells you how old you are and me too. <laughs> and the association with the Kennedy Center. I have believed in the mission of the Kennedy Center the entire time that I was here as a faculty member. And I am very happy that we now have the Institute for the Study of Europe. It's a marvelous thing. I hope all of you students who have an interest in Europe will take advantage of it. We have wanted this for years. And I would like to thank all of those here at the university who, uh, who worked hard in order to make this possible. <clears throat> I, oh, many of you have served missions, I think, to Europe or elsewhere. I hope that you'll do everything in your power to not only maintain the language that you work diligently to learn, but also that you'll deepen that with an understanding of the culture uh, and that, that you will be very good uh, ambassadors of those countries and those peoples where you served, uh, wherever you go in the world. Uh, that, is a, that is a role that we can play that very few others uh, can. And so don't let your language abilities get rusty and, and uh, read and study and while you're here take classes uh, so that you really know something meaningful about these countries where you were. <clears throat> I want, I'm happy to talk about Poland today. I didn't know much about Poland before 1998, but uh, uh, I, I learned that I better learn fast. Uh, and, and so I did, and I was very happy that I was sent there to be a missionary. Um, <clears throat> there's a big disparity in this country between what Poland is and what Poles are and what we think they are. And so I certainly, I, I grabbed at this chance to speak to you today uh, in the hope that I can communicate a little bit of, of, the, uh, of what I think of Poles and how much I like them and how much, uh, what an honor it was to be in their country and to get to know them. Some of you may know a little bit about the, uh, the unkind Polak jokes that used to be told. I hope I never hear another one again. And I hope I never hear it from anybody who's from BYU. Uh, the only thing about these jokes that's significant is that they tell a lot more about the people that tell them than about the po folks that they're about. And uh, they are, because I discovered that Poles are very intelligent, they are literate, incredibly literate, 
They're proud of their language and their literature. They are a bit too pessimistic for me, but then if you'd had their history, you might be too. Uh, they are, uh, they su suffer from a little bit of a collective inferiority complex, but I'm going to say today that I believe that that is changing. But they are warm and friendly and faithful friends. And, uh, and it is, a, uh, it is a pleasure to, to be able to say something about this country. At the moment, in the last few years, um, there's been, there's been so much news elsewhere in the world that we haven't paid much attention to what's going on in Europe. And particularly not with smaller countries. I watch every day to see what kind of news there is in the paper uh, about Poland, and uh, sometimes we'll go weeks on end without hearing anything. But it, it, nonetheless, it is a very important country, and what is going on in Europe is uh, of great significance to the world. I have three, th three thoughts that I want to uh, try and develop today. The first one is this. Today's Poland and its foreign and security policies, that is, full participation in Europe through membership in the European Union, while preserving uh, newly established security ties with the United States and NATO, is the best understood this policy is best understood by a greater familiarity with Polish history, especially during the past century, but reaching back now almost 300 years. That may be true for other countries. I'm sure it is. The, uh, but but the, uh, the significance of knowing the Polish past for understanding the country today cannot be overstated. Here's the second point. Especially in these times of spreading democratic societies, an understanding of history provides valuable insight into the formative influences on a whole people's collective psyche. Policymakers would thus do well, in my judgment, to pay some attention to the forces of continuity in every country's experience, but particularly in the Polish historical experience, as well as the forces of change. There's a tendency to, to emphasize what is contemporary and to emphasize change, and historians are interested in change. But good historians, in my view, are also interested in continuity and in the balance between continuity and change. And, and, uh, and so I think this is also true with, for Poles. As Janusz Reiter, a Warsaw think tank boss and a former Polish ambassador to Germany explained it with some bit of understatement, quote, if you have the historical experience of Poland, then you have a strong need for security. And if you know anything at all about Polish history, you'll understand the importance of that statement. So uh, history can, is, is meaningful for democratic societies, particularly to, to get in and understand what is motivating, what the attitudes and traditions and things that are taken for granted are among a populace. They are more difficult to study, but they can be learned primarily through history and the study of institutions and the study of language and literature and culture. And all of those, I believe, uh, help us to, to gain a much better uh, grasp of a contemporary society. I think also the, one of the great things about history is that you don't live in the eternal present. That is, that you assume that everything is and was and will be similar to what it is now. That you, that, that, that you realize that many problems that exist have existed for a long time. 
And so you don't I say you, you're, you're not assuming that everything is, is uh, something that we're experiencing for the first time. Another uh, uh, important feature of studying history for an understanding of foreign policy and security policy is perspective. You have uh, history gives you a wonderful perspective for these matters. The third point is this. Because of this history, and especially over the past century, I believe today's Polish democracy has a good chance for success. So I'm not very Polish on that. I'm something of an optimist. I, I, I feel like I'm in good company. President Hinckley is a real optimist. And whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, I don't know if you thought about it, either one is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Unfortunately, again, understandably, Poles have, have, have had this long-standing pessimism, and I hope they're able to balance it out a little better. Today's Polish democracy has a good chance for success, similar to that of Germany after World War II. Now, most in this audience are not, haven't lived long enough to remember that, but it, was an, it, it is an incredible achievement following World War II. I sure, or certainly hope that all of you will study that, particularly those who of you happen to be interested in Europe, that you will study what happened after World War II, how we, the, uh, the United States and allies and NATO, responded to this, uh, and uh, and uh, what what kind of a pattern it has given us for our learning how to deal with other countries. Um, this democracy has a good chance for success, partly because of its impending admission in May of 2004 to the European Union, and partly because of its historic and contemporary ties with the United States. So those are the three issues, the three uh, ideas that I am uh, most interested in today. I'm sure that all of you who, uh, who read the news are aware that in the past few months uh, the, the polls have had a little more recognition in that they have been supporters of American policy in Iraq uh, they have sent troops there. Uh, their neighbors have not been keen on them doing this. But I believe it is uh, very intelligible, again, given uh, their own experience and given their lack of confidence in Europe's ability to provide security for Europe, and particularly security for the so-called new nations. Um, now, a, a little bit about a few basic facts about Poland that maybe will be of use to you. Uh, I hope everyone realizes that Poland is in Central Europe and not Eastern Europe. If you don't believe that, ask any Pole on any street. Uh, it, uh, they were, Poles were, uh, everyone said that, that they, because they were part of the Soviet bloc that they're part of Eastern Europe. They're not. They are part of Central Europe, and they have always been part of Central Europe. Most of their history is tied to Central Europe, and that that is tied to the East is not particularly happy. Uh, Poland borders on seven other countries with the longest border, 658 kilometers, with the Czech Republic. It also has a significant coastline on the Baltic. Poland is 120,000 square plus square miles, about the size, a little less than the size of the state of New Mexico, and one and a half times the size of Utah. Um, it is, in, with, with that kind of size, it is larger than Great Britain and Italy and smaller than Germany, France, and Spain. It has a population of 38,622,000, slightly less than Spain, 
and currently has zero population growth. You may think that's not great, but many of the other countries of Europe have less than that. They are not replacing their population. Uh, it's a matter of some, some considerable significance. And for those who will be studying Europe in the future, it's something for you to tuck away as an important factor. It also has a, 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 a sort of a neutral net, net migration rate. <clears throat> Life expectancy for Poles is about 74 years. Today's Poland is the most ethnically homogeneous in the whole of Polish history. There has never been a time when this is uh, in where, where this has the, uh, been the case. 97.6 percent of the population are Poles. 1.3 percent Germans. Six-tenths of a percent Ukrainians, five percent, five-tenths percent Belarusians, and a very, very few Jews. If we were talking about this prior to World War II, uh, you would see that it was completely different. That there were six million Jews that lived, plus six million plus that lived in Poland, uh, millions of Ukrainians and Germans, and others, uh, uh, but now as the borders were moved west and as there was this huge out-migration of Germans, about uh, seven to eight million from Poland and about 12 million altogether from Central Europe that moved west ahead of the Soviet, the Red Army, Poland especially became a country now for Poles. Uh, that is a matter of some significance. Uh, re as far as religion is concerned, Poland is 95% Catholic, Roman Catholic, with 75% practicing. Uh, Eastern Orthodox, Protestant, other churches make up about 5%. <clears throat> Um, and Poland is the most religious country, I think we can fairly say that, is the most religious country in all of Central Europe and maybe all of Europe. Uh, these are people who, uh, who still care about, many of them, about the basics of religion. And the basics are these. That they, that they believe in God, they care what he thinks about them, they, uh, they believe that religion is relevant to life and has something to say about uh, the, the meaning of a person's life. And that's, that, that is something that, that is less and less true about much of the rest of Europe. Only Polish is spoken in Poland. And now, and it has a government with a president, a prime minister, two house parliament, the same in the Senate, and with about eight significant parties and numerous others. So that, that is a sort of, sort of a thumbnail script, uh, uh, description of what it is uh, of, of Polish facts today. Now I'd like to turn to, uh, first of all, some of the recent Polish achievements. Um, because they are significant. There's never been a time in Polish history when the country has, uh, has had as much respect, the people, from the world, the informed world, as they have now. And here's why. First of all, the Poles developed during communist days uh, an autonomous resistance to what we now call full Stalinization under communism. That means, for example, that, that the full police state was not established. It means that most of all of the power rested in the hands of Polish communists and these communists had a tendency to be more Polish than communist, fortunately. It means that full-scale collectivization that was, 
that, that was so horrific in the Soviet Union did not come to Poland. That is, it came briefly. But, uh, but the only way that this was going to be established in Poland was a mass slaughter of Polish peasants. And the, 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 the Soviet government was not willing to do this. Another was the resistance, the effective resistance of the Roman Catholic Church, and particularly the leadership of Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski. Uh, those of us who are older will remember uh, Cardinal Wyszynski as a great man, a man of great courage and strength. And what I think is even more important is that Cardinal Wyszynski was the mentor of today's Pope. He was the mentor of Cardinal Wojtyla, the, uh, the present Pope John Paul II. He was a man of, who, who provided a focal point of courage and strength for Poland in the days of communism. And it wasn't possible. It simply was not possible. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't worth doing for, so for the communists now to come though they tried for several years to try and oppress, let alone root out, the, the Catholic Church in Poland. I think it's one of the achievements is that Poles were among the early critics of communism. Very effective critics. For those of you who may be interested in reading this, you can read some of the works of Polish intellectuals like Leszek Kołakowski, uh, the present-day editor of the Gazeta Wyborcza, the largest newspaper, most influential newspaper in Poland, Adam Miśnik, and Jacek Kuron. And you can also look at the work of uh, Czesław Miłosz, who was the uh, Nobel Prize winning author, novelist, who tells us something in there about, about the Polish reality, marvelous works that, that show insight into uh, what it was like to be a Pole and to be a communist. The other I've already said, mentioned, the election of, of uh, uh, John Paul II with his, he had a well-known record of opposition to communism uh, before he was made the Pope. And if you if you talk to Mr. Wawensa, we had the privilege of having an interview with Mr. Lech Wawensa while we were there up in his office in Gdańsk. And if you talk with him, he will discuss with you in a, in a marvelous way, the impact that the Pope had on Polish Catholics. Now, now not everybody in solidarity were, were practicing Catholics. That in and uh, of itself is a remarkable thing. But, um, but I, I think we cannot underestimate the, um, the impact of the, uh, of the Pope as a Catholic uh, on that country. For those that of you, however, who are Latter-day Saints here, I think it also might be interesting to consider this. In 1977, uh, the prophet Spencer W. Kimball came to Warsaw on the 24th of August and dedicated that country for the preaching of the gospel. Uh, you really have to know a little something about that era um, to realize the significance of this. But it was a t at a time of when, when communism was well established, very strong, not just in Poland, but elsewhere. And uh, if you thought that it appeared that communism would be there forever in ni before 1989, as most experts did, Think of what it looked like in 1977. But listen to this one paragraph now in the, in the light of what has happened from this one paragraph of the dedicatory prayer uh, for Latter-day Saints, Poland's patriarchal blessing. 
We pray that no wickedness or combination of evils could possibly rise up against this nation and that they will be de delivered. You, I, I, I stopped there for a moment because one of the great concerns for Poles for the past 50 years prior to 1989 was be making sure that there was not a Soviet invasion of their country, similar to, to East Germany in 1953, Hungary in 1956, Czechoslovakia in 1968, that was a very real possibility. The Poles were close at hand. Uh, and so the, 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 the significance of that does not escape any Pole. We pray that no wickedness or combination of evils could possibly rise up against this nation and that they will be delivered from the hand of wicked assassins and from all their enemies and evil deeds of enemies may be confounded to the end that this people may live in peace and comfort and happiness and that they may hear the word of the Lord with gratitude. Now, I believe that we have already seen a, con a considerable fulfillment of this prophecy. Uh, but there is much yet to be done, and I believe, I believe that what, is, what we have going now is in fact a Poland that, is, uh, that, that has greater freedom, greater prosperity, greater respect for human dignity than it, during the, uh, the last 400 years. <clears throat> I'm continuing now with recent events that I think have, 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 are changing, have begun to change uh, Poland. Uh, the next one is the creation of the Solidarity Movement, the Solidarność. This is an incredible achievement because of the disunity, the historic disunity in Poland that has existed for a very long time. It is an incredible achievement because it was a coming together of people, of, of, of bureaucrats who were in the Communist Party but not satisfied with what was happening, a group of very bright intellectuals, and not only bright but wise, who understood the importance of not challenging communism directly and who emphasized the need to achieve a, 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 a civil society, a civil society, and working class people, and that the, the unity of intellectuals and working class people is sometimes rather hard to come by. Working class people for whom communism was supposed to be their great, it was to bring them the, the great uh, advantage here in, the, in, the, in this world, and to have with, these, with the, both these common people and some of the intellectuals the blessing and leadership of the Catholic Church. All of this came together in 1980. Until, and, and there were many days, there are many times in the 10 year history of solidarity when it looked like that this was, that, that the movement was over. And incidentally, after two, the year 2000, the election of 2000, the solidarity has broken into any number of, of, uh, pieces and doesn't constitute any kind of a significant force in Polish political life anymore. So they came together and at one time the Solidarity Movement had 10, 10 million adults in the country supporting it. Um, and not only this, but, but Solidarity was guided in a way now that made it possible to minimize bloodshed. So that change came about, I realize there are other forces there, we know that, 
the coming of Gorbachev, the role that the United States under President Reagan played. There are many factors involved, but solidarity was a significant one, and that Poles took the lead uh, and were successful has brought them a new level of respect in the world that, uh, that they had not known before. Another uh, recent achievement, the establishment of the Republic of Poland in 1990 with a new constitution guaranteeing basic freedoms, human rights, democracy, a market economy, and the promise of peace, security, and increasing prosperity. And if you go back and look at this, you, you, one, of, one of the great sources, great documents of Polish history is the constitution of the 3rd of May, 1791. And the 3rd of May is today the national holiday because of this. This is the, the, this is, uh, the constitution that was put together by reformers, by friends of Tadeusz Kosciuszko, who served over in the American Revolutionary War, uh, and the and who was a, a passionate, a passionate believer in liberty, and believer that the Poland of his day had to be reformed, even though it was only a rump, and the third, the third, the the second and third partitions were were right in the offing. Um, this. Republic of Poland is today's is hooking on to a wonderful tradition that existed in that constitution that was never implemented until 1990. Uh, another achievement has been to become a member of NATO. We were there at the time in 1999 that Poland was accepted into NATO. And I'm proud that one of the people who played a role in that is a BYU graduate who came there several times as chairman of the Europe subcommittee of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Gordon Smith of Oregon. Uh, he came there three times during the time we were there. I'm happy to boast that he's one of my former students. Um, and um, and he made a huge difference be, with with the Polish leadership because they realized he was very upfront about his about his religious beliefs. Um, uh, but they realized the leadership realized they had a great friend here, and they did. Uh, and Senator Smith played a role in helping Poles to become part of NATO. And, the, and helping also to strengthen and modernize the Polish military. Uh, that is a matter, heaven knows that needed some attention. Uh, and, and, uh, and that has, is now coming about. And then the other achievement is pending, and that is the admission of Poland to the European Union in May of 2004. What does that mean? Well, it means that Poles are going to be inside of the Union. It means that they are, that, that, uh, that Poles are turning their backs on uh, a horrific kind of nationalism that enveloped them and also other countries of Europe and led to so much misery. It means that Poles are, can look forward to some prosperity, some greater prosperity. It won't happen overnight uh, as members of the European Union. It means that Poles will have a greater degree of, uh, of uh, association with the most progressive parts of Europe. And so for all of these, all of these recent events, um, it seems to me that uh, Poland, uh, things are looking well there. Now, I want to just uh, mention for the next 10 minutes, and then we'll open this to question, a couple of more points. First of all, Polish ties to Europe. Um, 
and part of this is very obvious, and so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But, and then I want to look at Polish ties to the United States. The Polish ties to Europe are the Latin alphabet and the Roman Catholic tradition. I believe that this latter is the most important influence in all of Polish history. It means that Poland was to be part of the Roman, of the Western Christian Church, Western civilization, and that it, that it was that it was part of this. At the same time, Poland was never part of the Holy Roman Empire and was never then dominated like some other country areas were, Bohemia for one, uh, in uh, uh, by by German influences until the coming of the. Uh, of the partitions. The Poles participated in a great way in the scientific revolution. Think about the work of Copernicus and Hevelius and much later of Madame Curie and you will realize that here was, this was no scientific backwater. Regardless of the, uh, what university you were at, incidentally Poland is a country that, with universities that go back to the 14th century. Poland is a country that had that had a long tradition of inviting Jews into the country. Now later on there was an anti-Semitism, that's right. But Poland but Polish tradition was one of inviting Jews and making them a part of society. Poles participated in the Renaissance and the Reformation. They participated and contributed to the Enlightenment to the French Revolution, to the rise of nationalism. They were part of, of course, the partitions of Poland that had Poland, you need to know this because it is, it's very unique, that Poland was erased from the map of Europe in 1795. But Poles were not erased. They were not erased. And the thing that kept Poles together was Polish language, Polish traditions, Polish culture, and the Catholic religion. At a time when there was no nation state, at a time when everybody was, uh, ever, all the other countries were developing this. In January of 2001, we had a wonderful experience that relates to this. BYU had a collection of Polish documents. It was called the Pototsky Archive. The Pototskys are a famous, uh, noble Polish family that go way back. We had bought these documents as part of a larger purchase in 1985. And we were able then, some of you may be aware of this, we were able then in January of 2001 to give these documents back to Poland. It was, it was only a third of the Pototsky archive, but it was significant. But here's what I didn't know and didn't realize. And that is, uh, when, until I was meeting with uh, Professor Dr. Nowinch, who is the head of the archives, she said to me, do you realize that this gift is more valuable than you think it is because during the late 18th and the 19th centuries, when all of the rest of the country were building their archives, we were not a state. And so we're having to build this afterward. And one of the great advantages is for us to get a hold of these private archives that help to fill some of the gaps that we have. And they have large gaps. And at the same time, they were negotiating for documents in Germany and documents in Israel uh, to, to now to round out the holdings in the National Archives. Well, the partitions of Poland uh, had an enormous impact on Polish identity. And, they, and Poles tried to solve this problem by a series of uprisings, none of which were successful. They had to learn that the heroic uh, attempt is not the same as actually achieving the goal. And here's what Poles learned. They learned that they had, that, that everything that affected Poland was something that they could not do alone. 
they had to do this in, with, with the help of others. That's why these, this partition, part, participation in Poland now is of such importance. Poles are working within organizations to uh, uh, bring about what is best for the country. <clears throat> Poland's past, as well as its future, they learned must be solved within a European and maybe beyond Europe framework. Poles also participated in the major European revolutions, including, I mentioned the French Revolution, the Population Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, the emergence of nationalism and socialism. They were part of all of these movements. They were also, as I'm sure most of you know from your reading, deeply affected by the world wars, more than perhaps any other country in the world. World War I saw them as a, a being thrown back and forth between the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance. But in the end, World War I it was that gave Poles the chance to be restored as a nation state. And one of the great, uh, great results of this is the, uh, the sense that Poles feel of gratitude to President Wilson and the United States for that. World War II brought a fourth partition of Poland, six million dead. The, the reality that most of the Holocaust was carried out on their soil, and with it, communism. Now, if you can think of a worse uh, trio than that, to have come to your country, I'd like to hear it. This was the result. No country suffered in World War II like the Poles did. Poles were also deeply involved in the Cold War, and they were they, they uh, played uh, particularly as part of the uh, Soviet group. And now, and now, the future of Poland is that of a participant in the newly established, the newly being established Europe. Now, I'd like to say a word about uh, Polish ties with the United States. There are, of course, the traditions of Kosciuszko and Pulaski in the Revolutionary War. Uh, Kosciuszko is particularly significant because of what he learned here in the United States and what he tried to take back to his own country. And while he did not succeed, he did establish a tradition that this generation is hooking on to. And so, so in that sense... Modern liberal uh, and uh, independence, modern liberty, modern human rights do have a connection if for Poland in, the, in Kosciuszko and his friends from the late 18th century. There's also the influence of the American Constitution on the Constitution of 1791 and on the Constitution that they have now. There is, above all, a huge Polish emigration. This is called Polonia. These are Poles, one out of every seven Poles doesn't live in Poland. The second largest group of people from Europe uh, in this country are Poles. And these, these Poles uh, have played an enormous role in political and otherwise in uh, allying the United States with Polish concerns in the late 19th and throughout the 20th centuries. Let me tell you what the difference of that is. Even young people your age in Poland know that in, in 1934 they signed a treaty, Poland signed a treaty with France and, and Great Britain to protect them in case of a Nazi invasion. 36, I guess it was. And then that was not honored. And so to this very day, almost all Poles know this. Can you be sure that France and Britain will come to your aid? They're not sure about that. And they were particularly made not unsure about it in the Kosovo experience. 
Because with this, um, the, this inferiority complex that Poles have about being a small country and the United States and all these countries won't come because of our interest if it's not in their interest. When the United States went into Bosnia and Kosovo, you may not have thought that was too significant, but it sent a big message to people like Poles. That is, that if you want to have any real security in the today, you need to be sure you are, have the support of the United States. You need to be sure that, that we are part of NATO. And so they have this delicate balancing act right now that, that derives in part from their own history of, of we, we want to be on the good side of the United States at the same time that we are working to be taken into the European community. There's also the uh, American support for Poland, both governmental and popular, during the Cold War. Do you realize how many thousands of Poles benefited from packages that were sent by their relatives or friends of their relatives during the Cold War? It's very different than almost any other country that was part of the, uh, of the Soviet bloc. <clears throat> now I, I conclude this, my part, with uh, some challenges for Poles and Poland in the future. I don't want to come across as a Polish Pollyanna, but I'm close. Uh, there are problems, and they're significant problems. I'm listing just five of them. The first one is that the Poles need time. It's like Weimar Germany. The Poles need time to learn and institutionalize democracy. Poles need to be converted to the responsibilities of modern democracy. And it takes time to do that. And it takes good circumstances. And so the government needs to look at 18% unemployment, for example. And it needs to look at sectors of the country and areas of the country up in the northeast, for example, that are suffering uh, in the economy. The second, the government needs to end its divisions, its bickering, its corruption, and the appearance of corruption and self-interest, and serve the people of Poland so that they are able to develop greater confidence and trust in their government and, and democracy. Government needs to tackle the problems, the real problems of Poles and move ahead with the privatization of larger industries. They've done pretty well with smaller and medium-sized ones, but they need to tackle the privatization of larger in indus industries, and that's going to take some political will. They need to show some early ten tangible benefits from membership in the European Union. I believe that the Union understands this. But it will take a lot. Uh, Poles still have 27% of their people in farming. We have 2%. Polish farms are, need, are far too inefficient. They're too small. They, are, they contribute less than 4% to the GDP of the country. This is an area that has got to be modernized, but it's got to be modernized in a way now that helps people uh, in, in, uh, to, do more, to deal with this more gradually. Finally, Poles need to continue their policy of firm commitment, both to Europe, to, to, to Europe, NATO, and to the United States to have the kind of security and the kind of prosperity that they're hoping for. Thank you.